Time for another story from a hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Billy McLaughlin's Prank Hello there. We found a story in the scrapbook tonight that will bring back fond recollections of one of the harbor's happiest men, a prankster extraordinaire, and a mighty handy man with a shotgun. In fact, one of the best shots that the harbor's ever known. If you haven't already guessed it, it's Billy McLaughlin, William S. McLaughlin to be formal. Billy, that was the way everybody one knew him, was at one time a sales manager for the Grays Harbor Commercial Company of Cosmopolis and for many years city clerk in the Harbor City. He has a host of friends still around here and last heard of Billy, he had retired and lived in Seattle. If a man had friends, it was Billy McLaughlin. He called them all by their first names, and he could count on his friends just as his friends could count on Billy. And there was one thing that everyone could count on for Billy. That was a straight shot when he squinted down the barrel of his long shotgun. Tonight's story has to do with Billy and his gun and his sense of humor. But before we get into that yarn about good old Billy McLaughlin, Let's have Dick Crombie say a few words from our sponsor. Now back in the days before there was enough land cleared in this county to make a golf course, a few fields suitable for baseball, about the only sport that the men of the town enjoyed besides politics and hot stove leaguing was trap shooting. But they did enjoy this and they took it mighty seriously. Some of those old-timers, J.W. Clark, for example, the publisher of the Grays Harbor Post, would go any distance for a trap shoot. Most of those old-timers came from pioneer stock, and they had a lot of respect for a rifle or a shotgun. Owning, using, and taking care of a good shooting piece was bred into their veins. Some of them were high-caliber shots, and one of the very best was Billy McLaughlin. Billy was one of Cosmopolis's leading citizens. As sales manager for the commercial company, he was in step with the important people over there. And because he was an all-around man's man, a timber cruiser, a mechanic, a sportsman, he was in step with everyone else. Now the traps at which the old-timers shot were up on the hill in the back of the town just about where Neil Cooney built what they called the Spruce Cottage, the building that is now the clubhouse for the Highlands Golf Course. There was nothing fancy as traps went, but for this was the only place where they had the high quality equipment and the men who shot for keeps there fired away at a lot and used a lot of ammunition. Sandy would find the shooting range lined up with shooters banging away at clay pigeons and some good shooting was turned in on those old traps. Well, everyone in a while some ammunition manufacturer would send a sales representative down here to peddle his wares and to try to stock up the local men with a supply of his particular brand of ammunition. Because the salesmen were usually crap shops themselves, it became a tradition among the shooters to have a pretty substantial turnout for the shooter with some sort of celebration and then turn the traps over to their guest and let him demonstrate his ammunition and ability. If he could pot shot the clay birds as they snapped out of the boxes and if his score was good, he usually sold a lot of ammunition. If he shot poorly, they usually called him a good fellow and showed him the town though they might not invest heavily in his product. Well, on this particular occasion, one of the big-time salesmen from the Western Ammunition Company was due in town, and he had given plenty of advance notice 
so that way they could prepare a pretty grand affair for his arrival. And while the members of the Shooters Club arranged to have the, the traps readied for most members, and some talked taking a proper refreshments, Billy McLaughlin went about preparing a reception of his own. He went to work to be exact in the woodworking shop on turning a turning lathe that was used for making odd bits of furniture and knickknacks. He did a powerful lot of turning and plied the shavings high on the floor. Then he did some extra particular work with a mixture of stove polish and oil. Now the ammunition salesman arrived in Aberdeen and covered his territory here on the morning of the big day. He called on some of the sporting good and hardware stores in the early afternoon, caught the streetcar for Cosmopolis, and met some of the shooters in the office of the commercial company. There was a big turnout at the traps on top of the hill when the group arrived there because the salesman shooter was regarded as one of the best shots in the business, a man who could knock down 25 out of 25 time after time. Before he began to shoot, he opened a fine leather case and took out his pet gun, a finely machined Belgian piece with an elaborate engraved barrel and a custom-shaped stock. He invited some of the select to handle the piece, weigh it, feel its perfect balance, and admire its fine workmanship. He disassembled it and displayed its finely mechanized action. Then he broke out the stock of his shells, told someone about the quality of the ammunition, and loaded his gun. There was hardly a sound along the line when he took his place in the shooter's box and shoved a shell into the chamber of his gun. He was ready for trial. And he posed his assurance. His very bearing made folks certain that they were watching an old master at work. As he told Billy McLaughlin, who was in charge of the traps, let him go. And Billy did. The first pigeon arced into the air, and the marksman lifted his gun expertly and fired. The pigeon kept right on going and landed intact, all in one piece. For a moment, the shooter looked quizzically at the pigeon, and then, as a few chuckled and a few snickers came from the crowd, he forced a laugh of his own and stepped back from the box for just a minute. He wiped the barrel of his gun and stock carefully, then stepped back into the box and rammed another shell into the chamber. Again he called for the pigeon, and again Billy let one go. The gun cracked, but the pigeon kept right on going, landing in one piece not far from the first. This time the laughs were pretty audible, and the shooter wasn't able to manage one. His, his thinned out, and his jaw took a grim set. This time he called for another quickly, and again it passed through the hell of shots untouched, apparently. At least, it fell in one piece. At this time he called for a string, and the supposed clay pigeons began to snap from the trap in succession with measured timing. The shooter fired and fired and fired. Finally one broke, then another string of them went through another blast of shots unharmed. When the string of 25 had been shot, only one clay pigeon, just one, that was all that had been broken. The witnesses had stopped laughing. They realized the seriousness to the salesman of such a demonstration. There was an embarrassed silence as he fingered his fine gun. Now hot with the string of fire, he looked along the row of spectators as though he would be challenging any man who so much as smiled about it, but no one smiled. It was an awkward moment, and the shooter broke the awkwardness with a suddenness, taking the gun by its engraved barrel. Warm though it was, he walked across to the clearing to a six-inch alder tree and swung it vigorously. The stock snapped. He swung again, and the barrel bent thrice and four times. He flailed the tree with a broken weapon and threw the twisted remains into a cluster of trees. He walked back and picked up his shooting gear and stomped off down the hill. There was a moment of nervous embarrassment on the hilltop then. One of the sportsmen walked out of the grassy slope covered with fragments of broken pigeons. And 
with the scattered 24 targets that had eluded the markman shot pattern. He looked down at the unbroken pigeons and kicked one. He kicked it again. He looked over the other traps and Billy McLaughlin, who was trying to busy and look unconcerned about the stack of pigeons, had been amassed for the shooter. The sportsman stopped and picked up the pigeon. He hefted it, turned it over, and walked over to another. He picked that one up and looked quizzically at both sides. Then he laughed. A great roaring, unrestrained laugh that brought everyone on the hill to his side. Everyone, that is, except Billy. He displayed the pigeons, and there was a mad scramble to gather up the rest of the unbroken disc. At that moment, they became souvenirs of one of the harbor's early practical jokes, for the pigeons were not brittle clay that would shatter at the impact of the shot. They were turned out of good, solid Douglas fir, the blackened and shined with the stove polish. Every one of them was filled with the shot of the salesman expert shooting. No blast of a shotgun could ever break them. But one of the spectators had a question. One of them busted, he said. How come one of them busted? The crowd turned to the trap puller, Billy. Billy stroked his chin and kicked the sand with his feet into a little pile. Well, he said grudgingly, I figured that a man could shoot as well as he could. would get suspicious if he didn't break even one. So I put one clay pigeon in just to make sure that it was all right. And that was the story of Billy McLaughlin's prank, a practical joke that old timers still chuckle about and say Billy was full of them. We have a few other items to take up here, but we're going to stop for a few words from Dick Crombie and our sponsors. You know, the other night we had a story about the old Grand Theater. Now, it was only 15 minutes along, and we could, could only pack in the big-name performances into a quarter of an hour. So we had to admit some of the important performers and performances that took place in the footlight of the historic old stage. And as a result, we were bombarded with phone calls from old-timers who felt that their favorite program or performer had been slightened. Take Bill Fletcher, the town humorist. Bill felt bad not to hear mention of Maud Powell, the great violinist. And there were one or two others that Bill missed. He would have liked to have hear, heard mention of William Howard Taft, who spoke at the Grand Theater while a member of Teddy Roosevelt's cabin and was himself raised to presidency a few years later. Bill, incidentally, was a fiddler in the orchestra that rang up the curtain at the Old Grand and about as well versed on early day performances in the old show house as anyone in town. Then there was Dennis Atwood, the old timer whose yarns, who often appeared in print, and who can trace back more than 60 years of local history. Dennis felt that we missed two important pieces of narratives when we left out Harry Lauder and the Sousa Band, both headline attractions at the Old Grand Theater. And there were others who didn't hear the mention of a show that they once saw there that left a long-time impression. Probably if we had wanted to fill space, we could have replaced reeled off a list of shows and performers that would have filled a full quarter of an hour. But we had to be sparing somewhere, and the shows we mentioned tonight and the personalities are just a few of the many that came to Grace Harbor. The New York production of Eugene O'Neill's Strange Interlude played in the show house, and people went early and took time out for dinner at, at the intermission period. But we'll take time one of these nights to dig back into the scrapbook for a few more details on those old productions at the Grand Theater and some of the people who made them. Great news in a small town and an important part of our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.